This is my counsel. Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Thank you for listening. Anybody who knows me well knows that there's a question that I ask most people I meet. It's a question I think every writer should be asking. And for that matter, every reader should be asking. I sometimes refer to it as my signature question. And that question is this, what are you reading? What are you reading? As writers, we all want to know, well, we, we all should know what other people are reading. What's popular? What are, what are they reading? Why are they reading it? How has the author executed his or her craft? It's informative for us as writers, and it's also a great way to pick up reading tips. Lots of reading tips. Good reading makes for good writing. But I will tell you that a lot of times, the responses I get are depressing. There are a lot of people who say, I'm not really a reader, or I haven't read a book in years, or I can't remember the last time I read a book. Or they say that they read, but they only read nonfiction. And one of my issues with nonfiction writing is that it is so often drastically overwritten. What they have to say could be boiled down to a pamphlet, but they put gobs and gobs of filler in the book to pump it up to 300 to 350 pages or so, 400 pages, trying to make the book feel much more substantial than it really is. The points that they have to make are few. They give some examples. But, you know, you can't, you can't uh, really put a book on the market that's a simply, that's nothing more than pamphlet size. No publishing company is going to abide by that. I'm actually going to address that in a future podcast about how nonfiction writers so often waste our times and how to deal with that as a reader. Because I do read nonfiction. I mean, my day job, I'm reading nonfiction all day, but I, I still read some nonfiction books. But I think there's a certain approach to reading a nonfiction book that's wholly different than reading a novel. People are so busy these days reading social media nonsense, posting nonsense, frivolous nonsense, but they spend no time reading something longer form that will actually fortify them. One of the most ex inspiring pieces of information I heard recently regarding fiction writing and I heard this years ago, probably 10 years ago, that one of the medical schools in the United States is requiring its medical students to read novels. The reason being that they're trying to increase the emotional intelligence of their students so that their bedside manner, which is notoriously bad among doctors, is improved. Improved by reading about characters, the interaction of these characters, real meaningful dialogue, how people really talk to one another, or maybe should be talking to one another. And through that experience, increasing their empathy and emotional intelligence. I hope it's an experiment that's going well, and I hope it's being replicated. And I'm reminded of that George R.R. R. Martin quotation, that the person who reads lives a thousand lives in their lifetime. The person who does not read lives but once. How often do you run into situations where you hear acquaintances or even strangers talking about what they're reading? Overhearing any situation where people are talking about books and comparing what they're reading with one another. We hear constantly about what people are listening to on Netflix or Prime Video or Apple Television. And so many of these series that people watch these days and the movies that we go to come from novels. So many of them. And one of the interesting things I think has happened is that if you've had the experience of reading a good novel and then seeing the movie that's made after the novel, almost inevitably you're very disappointed with the movie because there's, a, there's so much that a movie cannot get to. A two or three hour movie can't possibly 
encompass the book. But then the streaming, the series, streaming services come along with these series and they've changed the game and they actually need books because they need a lot of written material. They need a lot of storytelling to carry something over nine or 12 episodes and multiple seasons, you know, six or seven seasons. So the very weakness of the movie, which is I've got 90 to 120 minutes to tell the story of this multi-hundred page novel to create a theatrical rendition of that book. Maybe you have read and you love. Turns out to be pretty much an impossible task with, with rare exceptions. So they try to give you this theatrical production of a book that you read and love because you had read, say, The, the Dinner or Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil or Bram Stoker's Dracula or The Da Vinci Code and the movie falls down. But given 30 or 40 hours or 50 hours to tell the story, given the option of episodic storytelling and presenting that novel over 30 or 40 hours and multiple episodes and multiple seasons. That changes everything. A director can now wrap his or her arms around that project. But why do people so often spend their time in the passive act of just sitting there and staring at the screen, letting the director make all the choices, instead of actually reading the source material, reading the book in its original form, and allowing those characters to materialize in your own mind. Where to a large extent, you're, you're actually the director. You create the, the visuals of the characters. I remember when Batman came out, the first one, and Michael Keaton was tapped to play Bruce Wayne and Batman. There was an uproar. He's not the guy, he's too small, he's not muscular enough, he's not macho enough. People were upset. That's not Batman. I felt the same way about Timothy Dalton being James Bond. The worst James Bond ever. And he's done good stuff in his acting career, but he's not James Bond. Sorry. When I read The World According to Garp, and then I saw Robin Williams playing the role of Garp, and Robin Williams was a spectacular actor. I have no qualms about that. But he was not Garp. He was not the right guy. He wasn't suitable for the role. He wasn't suited to what John Irving had written. But I digress. Now, what are you reading? What are the people around you reading? The most recent good answer I got was from a coworker who told me that she was reading, or maybe even rereading, the novel Perfume by Patrick Suskind. And she not only told me what she's reading, but how much she cherished that novel and how gorgeous the writing is. She elaborated on it, which I always look for. If somebody's going to tell me what they're reading, I want some elaboration. And I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list. The full title is Perfume, the Story of a Murder. And again, by Patrick Suskin, the last name spelled S-U-S-K-I-N-D, a German writer. And then on a recent Novelist Spotlight podcast, I'll give you one more. It was a podcast with Sandra Schofield who brought up Matrix by Lauren Groff, G-R-O-F-F. -F. Again, G-R-O-F-F, -F, Lauren Groff, Matrix. And she wasn't reading it right at the time, but she talked about it as one of those novels that she has read that um, spoke very highly of. Not to be confused with The Matrix, the movie The Matrix. This is something very different. Again, it's just Matrix. 
and uh, that's by Lauren, again, by Lauren Groff. But again, so often I get the, you know, I, I don't read, I'm not a reader, I, and, or I read, but I don't read any fiction. What that really tells me is that all of us, everybody out there who's writing fiction, is, are competing for a, a dwindling audience, a dwindling audience of readers. And this, I don't think, is an American phenomenon. I'm sure young people in India, in Iran, in Turkey, in Kenya, are probably uh, absolutely fixated with social media, reading slapdash tidbits of information from friends and strangers and conspiracy theorists. And they probably see reading a book as a project to read a full 300 pages or 400 pages as a project and something they don't want to tackle because everything in their life is quick. It's quick and dirty, unreliable, quick hit, short form, and that is that. They're in and out of it. What they don't realize is that a good piece of literature is like a love affair. It's like a relationship. Something you can read piece by piece and let it spread over time, over days, weeks, even months, if it's a big enough book. It's a whole different experience. And it's a solitary experience. It's not necessarily something that you're doing with anything else, anybody else. I mean, book clubs are always fun. There's something about having your own solitary experience that you really don't share with anyone else unless maybe they ask. Like maybe you or I come along and say to them, what are you reading? But you know, when you think about it, how many friends or family members or even acquaintances do you have that get involved in long-term relationships anymore? I look at young people today and everything is really short-term. My wife insists that it's because of dating apps, that you meet somebody, you start to date them, and at the first sign of trouble or boredom, you're right back on that app, figuring I can find somebody else now, and it's a new source of stimulus. So nobody really sticks with anything very long. It's kind of analogous to people being unable to stick with a piece of writing for very long, a, a, a storytelling experience for very long. There are hundreds or thousands of other people out there on the dating sites that you have access to and you can put the you can put the feeler out there and you can get together for the coffee or the wine the beer the hookup a three-day burn maybe and then it's off to somebody else we don't have patience anymore we don't have commitment anymore to a process it's not a project, it's a process to read a book. It's a love affair, it's an intellectual affair, it's an emotional affair. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining because I do not like complainers. I don't like negative people. But I guess we all have our things in life that we complain about, and that's one of them for me. I mean, what has happened to people that they don't have the attention span for the printed page anymore, or the, or the electronically printed page, or the oral storytelling that comes with an audiobook. The first information age was the, the invention of the Gutenberg, the printing press. For the first time, books were available not just to rich people. I mean, they were handwritten back in the day. They have to be replicated by hand so that took a lot of work, it took a lot of money, and only rich people could afford books. Then comes the Gutenberg, and books could be mass manufactured. Now suddenly it wasn't just the, the, the aristocracy that had access to books, it was everyday people. Then we created libraries where even peasants could go in there and have access to information. But things have marched on since then. Now information is spread through Yes, the printed word, but the velocity of information, instantaneousness, 
of sending an email or a text message or posting on a me social media site has changed a lot. And I use all of that. It's not like I surrender those and spend my time with books. I play all the channels. You know, it's not like I, I refuse to text or to email or, or go to a social media sites. I'm registered on multiple social media sites. And I work them at least every week and in a couple of instances, pretty much every day. So the first information superhighway was actually books. It sounds so prosaic now, but books ride on those same electrons that all other forms of information graphics ride on. Ebooks and audiobooks, and there's a form of instant gratification, being able to access a book and begin reading it or listening to it right away. So check it out. What are you reading is the question. Try asking some people that. And don't just listen to what they say. Look at the expression on their face. Because so often before they even say a word, their face will give you the answer. It'll send the message. The mouth drops open slightly and the face is frozen. And the face is frozen for just that moment in time. Just enough for you to know. What, that an what the coming answer, the coming verbal answer is. And that's just a split second, but, the, but those are the people who are gonna tell you, I don't, I'm not a reader, or I don't read books. And I would argue that's actually a great interview question for an employer. When you're hiring somebody for a job, if you were to ask that question, you can tell if they're fabricating, if they're, if they're making up a book, talking about a book that they really haven't read versus somebody who's ready to not only tell you what they're reading, but you ask them, what did you, what did you read before that one? And they've got a ready answer and they actually get into a discussion with you where they talk about those books and actually reveal to you that they understand what they read and may have some insights into it and also really confirm that, that they're not just bullshitting you. They might even take the time to ask you what you're reading, which would show interest, inquisitiveness, the kind of things most of us would look for when hiring an employee or wanting a coworker. That says a lot. I mean, to me, it says this is a person who can actually be engaged by the written form, which is critical because when you're in business, nothing important happens in business without it being written down. It's a document. You never say, yeah, Frank and I were talking in, in the bathroom about that project. And on the strength of just a verbal conversation between, say, a group of managers or, or the leadership group has a conversation and says, let's just go do it. There's got to be documentation. Nothing on paper, nothing written, nothing in the files, nothing disseminated. No way. No way. If it's important, it is written. The acts of Congress are in writing. Legislation is committed to writing. Legal doctrines and decisions are put into writing. So the person you're interviewing, here's a person who's going to have to deal with the written word. But it also shows you that they've got stick to -itiveness. They actually can read a book from beginning to end. That they've got the attention span and that they can lock onto something and get it completed. It shows that they have not fallen into the instant gratification trap. If they can't read a book, if they can't stick with a book long enough to read it and have a conversation with you, then how do they actually get any projects done, any work projects done, get them seen through to completion when they can't focus on attractive writing long enough to complete it? So would that be the litmus test for hiring somebody? Probably not. But you know, when you start to ask that question, you start to see some differentiation between different job applicants, your, your top candidates. And who knows, that could be the deciding factor, not just based on the fact that they have read something, but based on the adroitness of the conversation that ensues. 
something that demonstrates their mental acuity. That could be the difference between two close candidates. And if you think it's a photo finish, it could be the person who answers that question with some moxie that really deserves the job and is going to do the best job for you. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, execution is the chariot of genius. There's a lot of people with good ideas, and I used to fancy myself an idea guy. I've got lots of good ideas, and I always thought that they were superior. But everybody's got ideas, and a lot of people have good ideas. But what's really in short supply are people who can take an idea and actually develop it, actually execute it and see it through to the end. I've worked with plenty of people who are were given a project and they simply didn't know how to organize it and get it done. When I was hiring people, I paid a lot less attention to the resume. Obviously, they need to have the rec requisite education and experience, or at least experience, experience being education. So you have to have that. But what I really focused on was the cover letter. To begin with, could they write? Were they using proper grammar and punctuation? Were they promulgating thoughts and phrases that said something? Something more than, please accept the, the enclosed or attached resume as my application for such and such job. That's lame. I know nowadays it's a little bit different because what you have is you submit a resume, it's, it's run through an algorithm a filtering system which identifies that persons over the age of 40, let's say, so they kick you out automatically. I mean, there's a lot of ageism out there, and they wouldn't tell you that they're doing that, but that's what happens. They would never tell you that because it's illegal. They don't say like, hey, we're not even interested in people past the age of 30 or 40. So if you are a little more seasoned, you're actually a little older and with more experience, what I recommend people do is take dates off of your resume in terms of what years you went to college, uh, what dates you had, which jobs, cut your experience down to the core and the stuff that's really speaks to the job that you're applying for. Keep the experience relevant but brief. Do whatever you can to make sure that there's not a time signature on there that gets them to say, ah, the algorithm to say, ah, we know how old this person is. Because you'll get kicked out. So the cover letter isn't what it used to be. Uh, what I was just saying, that that's a little bit dated these days, but um, not that you don't put something into writing for job, job applications, but the problem, of course, is nobody's going to even pay any attention to that if you get kicked out of the system by the algorithm that is got a filtration system that's based on something other than real qualifications and a real look at the applicant. So the job hunt is not what it used to be. In some ways it's better. And in some ways it's not, like everything. So in closing, I hope I've demonstrated the utility of that question. What do you read? There's a lot of utility there. I'm, as I launched into the subject, I started to realize, I mean, I, I took this in some directions I didn't expect to, like a job applicant. I had never even thought of that before, but I, it came to me, and it makes perfect sense to me, and hopefully to you too. And, of course, it's a great way to find out what people are reading. Why are they reading it? What are they reading? It's very informative for us. If they can tell us why they like what they've read, talk a little bit about characterization or what have you. Most people aren't going to get into a lot of detail because they don't have the language for that or the experience for that, but it doesn't mean it isn't useful to, to us as writers and readers. You know, how are they engaging with it? And what do they have to say about why they like that author of that book? That's stuff we can actually put to use. And I can't be bringing this question up without answering it myself. So what am I reading? I'm reading a couple of things right now. I'm reading a Magica by Clive Barker, the horror slash fantasy writer. And I'm not even a horror fantasy reader so much, but Clive Barker's writing is just so exquisite and can be so powerful. 
that I love reading his stuff. And it's a big book. It's a big book. It's a big commitment. Not all of his books are big, but this one is. Weave World is another one with a big, big book. It's, you know, a doorstopper. And I'm also doing some rereading of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams. Love that book. Hysterically funny. And back when Douglas was still alive, he read the audio edition. That's what I'm listening to. And boy, can he read his own work. He's a great reader. And the emphasis he puts on so many different aspects of the book is something no other reader could do. Because he knew exactly what he meant when he was writing it at the time. And I'm starting to dabble in Donna Tartt's book, the Secret History. So what about you? You can write to me at novelistspotlight at gmail.com. I'd love to know what you're reading. This is my counsel for Novelist Spotlight. Choose your questions wisely. And thank you for listening.